everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the 70th session of the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. And every week, a new speaker is here to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and their photography experiences. If you haven't checked out the schedule for our upcoming presentations, be sure to check out the list on my website at lindanickel.com. Elaine Pruden is here to help me work the Zoom buttons. You want to say hello, Elaine? Hello, everybody. <laughs> My guest tonight is Don Simpson. As a photography instructor and lecturer, Don has developed a large number of photography programs that range from special techniques to presentations on general topics relating to the art of photography. In tonight's presentation, Improving Photography Through Gesture, Don is going to share with us what gesture is and how we can utilize this concept to better communicate the stories in our own images to hold a viewer's attention. This is Don's second presentation for us. The first one, Don introduced us to the art of skinography. And you can find that presentation on the YouTube channel. Welcome back to the Happiness Hour, Don. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. I'm glad to have you. Um, so let me see here. Um, one of the things I said, and I'm just going to hold you to it. I'm going to pin you down in front of witnesses. Um, Dawn and I have had conversations off camera. And, and this is just, the first one was scanography. This one's on gesture. When I first kind of met Dawn over zoom he went through a huge list of things that he has taught over the years so don um you're the 70th presentation since we started this so can i get you back next year sure yay okay so i i just want to get you on tape for saying yes and and that way um <laughs> I will I will work with you to get you back on the schedule because um, the first one you taught you were just really you're really good about breaking things down in a orderly you know there's organization to your presentations and um, I think people left with never heard of scanography and it, it was something that people wanted to try so um, you and we've talked a little bit earlier tonight about gesture and I still don't know what it is. So I'm glad to have you here and I hope that you can simplify it for, for people like me. So with that, I'll try. <laughs> use small words. <laughs> right, I think we should be set. Yep, I see your, your presentation. And Dawn, I didn't say this, but if I, there was, if I missed something in your introduction and that you wanna add, please feel free to, you know, kind of talk a little bit about your work that's not necessarily related to this presentation. I'll do a little bit of that inside the presentation oh, because it relates in some way. Okay. But this is not just, this is not really a book report, but I, I do want to say that over the years, artists, and if I put photographers, at least in that category as well, have used many different words, They're try, trying to all say the same thing, but but nobody centered on words. And so Jay Maisel, who's a world-renowned photographer in New York City, came up with a word that nobody was using, called it gesture, and now everybody's using gesture. And so when people hear the word gesture, they're often confused with a hand gesture. They think of that as like somebody waving their hand. Now, I'm not saying that's not a gesture, but that's not what we're gonna talk about here tonight. Because if we limited ourselves to human beings, and different motions, it doesn't even mean a movement. I saw some people on Instagram today talking about um, movement. It, it has nothing to do with movement either uh, because a building can have gesture, a chair can have gesture. And, and so hopefully I'll do a decent job of explaining it. And then, so about the first 15 minutes or so, maybe a little less than that will be more of a lecture textual, don't get discouraged. There's a lot of photos coming and I'll break it down into different categories that I see people shooting. So we'll talk about small animals and large animals and buildings and cityscapes and uh, people, uh, flowers. We'll talk about a lot of different things and I'll show you examples of things that were, where I've introduced gesture into that which hopefully causes a viewer to spend just that little extra time trying to figure out what's going on in that photo. 
and it, it's really not, it's, it's harder to describe than it is to do, but it's not technical, so that's good. So with that, uh, some of the photos you will see are what I'll consider good photos, not great photos, but they don't contain any gesture. But then I will sometimes take a similar photo and introduce gesture so that you can kind of see the difference that something with gesture has over something that does not. But Ansel Adams, our famous guy, said that a good photo was just a matter of standing in the right spot. He just didn't mention how long you might have to sit or stand there. So the first lesson in this, and many people have already said this in other presentations, is patience. You need to be willing to be open. And usually at this point, I like to tell the story that in the Sun City Photography Club, I led field trips, many, many field trips over the course of a couple of years. And invariably, when we got back in the car to come home after taking pictures for four to six hours, within a mile, somebody's going to crop up and say, so how many photos did everybody take? I took 600. And, and then somebody will say, wow, I think I was closer to 700. And I usually don't say anything. And then they finally said, well, Don, how many photos did you take? I said, you know, I don't really count photos, but yeah, I don't know, maybe 75. They said, oh, not a good shoot for you. You couldn't find anything to take pictures of. And I says, well, you can be the judge of that when we show each other the pictures. But my 42 year career was as a computer scientist in front of a computer screen. And I don't wanna spend time going through 700 photos. So I wanna make every photo count. So I'm gonna take those photos that mean something that are significant. And I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time taking picture of one thing from different perspectives to try to come up with a photo that's gonna have real impact. So I'm real happy if I walk away from a photo shoot with two or three really well done photos as averse to seven or 800 photos, maybe none of which are really that good. So, but patience is important. Yeah, you have to slow down, be willing to look at things from different perspectives. It's probably worth saying that I was taught by a, a, a 40 now 50 year professional photographer privately for about seven months, spent about three hours a week or so with him. And he, you know, he's an old film guy, so he's used to doing everything in the camera. So I do everything manually in the camera, but it means that I don't have to spend much time looking at a photo. It's rare that I spend more than two minutes in post-processing on any photo because I've already nailed most of the important points. Sometimes you have to do a crop here and there. So the first thing is patience. Uh, Bresson also said that photography is shouting how you feel. And that's really important. I need to be able to get my viewers of my photographs to feel perhaps what I was feeling. There was a reason that we picked up our camera, put it to our eye and clicked the shutter button. How does the viewer know what that reason was? Do we even know what that reason was? Or are we just happy snappers and we go out and go click, 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 click all over the place. For some people, that's great. For others like myself, that's not really what I am interested in doing. So it, to me, it's, it's really evoking the feeling, recognize the feeling, picturing myself how I might use this photo either in a presentation or as an art object on a wall or digitally sharing it. What am I going to use it for? Do I need to fill my disk, if you will, with uh, just a whole lot of pictures that I already have? Uh, no, is the answer. So I think being able to feel something and trying to figure out how I can pass that feeling on to people that might see this photo is important. So how did I get started? Well, the first thing's a Kodak moment. I grew up 20 miles south of Rochester, New York, the home of Eastman Kodak. It's a bedroom community and almost everybody worked for Kodak. So I've been surrounded by photography as long as I can remember. My brother worked for Kodak as an engineer with some of their patents uh, for uh, almost 30 years. And he took up a huge interest in photography 
for himself earlier than me and became a professional wedding photographer, or at least a semi-professional wedding photographer. From that, I kind of got the bug and got started. So I say it's a Kodak moment, but I've been around photography forever. Um, my mother uh, was responsible in part for my ability to see things that sometimes other people don't see. Because as a typical young boy, I bugged her till she would send me out and said, don't come back till dinner. Uh, and it's a cloudy day, so go lay on top of the uh, picnic table and look up in the sky and imagine what you can see. And I don't know how many people have done that exercise, but if you look at clouds and the way they move around, they suddenly become different pieces of art over time. And so sometimes I would lay up there until I got a bad sunburn and and look at the clouds because I could imagine all kinds of things that were out there. Little did I know at that time at five or six years old that I was actually learning to see and to imagine things. So that was a wonderful gift. I used to have a mountain property I spent the summers up in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. And they had a wonderful nature foundation there. And it, they have a symposium, a wildflower symposium for three days every year. And they invited Robert Llewellyn in. Robert's a world renowned photographer and he is actually the official state of Virginia photographer who focuses his time on trees and on translucent floral photography. I'm still trying to perfect the translucent. And if I ever do, I would offer that up as a lecture, but most incredible floral photography I've ever seen bar none. And there's two well-known photographers, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast that really have embraced this. But I got to spend a lot of time during the three days with him, including some special one-on-one -on -one sessions with me because I was dying to see exactly how he did this. And he was not gonna give that away in the lecture, but he said, if I'd buy him lunch, he would show me some pictures of his studio and give me the, at least the outline of how to do it. The rest of it, I could figure out. I have figured it out. I just haven't found the time with other things going on. Um, but he had a, a, a very interesting exercise. There was, I think, eight people taking his lectures and one of the lectures, he said, we're going to go for a walk in the woods. And he gave each one of us a canvas, a tarp, if you will. So we got to the trailhead and we only had to walk out, I don't know, three or 400 yards. And it was a nice spot. And he said, OK, I want everybody not to be close to anybody else. Lay out your tarps and then lay on your back so that you're looking up in the woods. And then for the next 30 minutes, I don't want anybody to say anything. You're not to use your cameras. Part of the time you should have your eyes closed. Part of the time you should have your eyes open. I want to teach you to slow down and see. That actually was one of the most interesting exercises I've ever done. Uh, here, I'd be nervous about snakes. There, I was nervous about bears. But I hoped that with that number of people, no bears were going to show up, and they didn't. But what it did was you suddenly heard birds flying from branch to branch, and you saw them. You saw butterflies fly by your face. You saw the wind ebb and flow in the trees. It was amazing how many things you see. And I walked that trail many times. I never saw most of the things I sat by sitting on my back looking at the sky for 30 minutes. And it's all again about patience, slowing down, be observing, determining what's important. And then in your own mind, you could figure out how you might take those photos. So then later on my own, I went back to the trailhead and took some of my own pictures there. I've mentioned, I think before, uh, I used to belong to a faith-based photography group I'm not going to go deeply religious on people here, but it was called the Eyes of Faith, which I think is pretty interesting as a camera. Effectively, those our camera was our eyes. And we kind of came together as a group saying, we think what's wrong in the world is words. People are using words, misinterpreting words, and we can't seem to agree on anything. Is there a way that we could 
express things through our photography without the use of words that almost everybody that looks at that photograph is going to come away with a very similar, if not the exact same feeling about that photo. And then they asked me if I would prepare, I had talked a little bit about uh, this topic and they asked if I would put together a presentation. So what you're going to see basically is that presentation with a few things changed around. So if you see some stuff in there about a hymn or something, it's, I'm, I'm not going to start singing or anything. But first, a little bit about Jay. I'm not going to read this to you. You can read, but he, he's a world renowned. He's 91 years old. As far as I know, he's still alive, uh, based in New York City. And he is a, a very good artist, a very good photographer, uh, a, a lecturer, teacher, author. He's written seven books. I have two of them. I uh, highly recommend them. One of them is Light Gesture and Color, which is what we're going to talk about today. And I have, it's not about the f-stop. He's a very colorful person. So you, if you are offended by language, you might be interesting. But he, he's a very colorful guy, full of knowledge. And when he was teaching, it was a little rich for me. He could command $5,000 a student, limit to six students for a five-day training session in Manhattan. You pay for transportation, lodging, and food. So it's not a cheap trip, but I've talked to people that have gone to it, and they're like, it's like unbelievable what you walk away with. He's also was a very good uh, uh, business person. For, he bought a six-floor bank building in Manhattan. He paid $102,000 for it, had 72 rooms, six floors. He lived there. He had a studio. He had his teaching. He had his development. He had his galleries, everything in this bank building. And he recently sold it for $55 million. So Jay's doing pretty well, but he's, a, he's an outstanding uh, individual. His subjects can almost be found on the streets of New York. That doesn't mean he necessarily is taking pictures of people because he sees gesture and shadows, he sees it in colors, he sees it in buildings, he sees it in all kinds of different ways. And so it's interesting to watch. He almost goes no place without a camera, but he only believes in a camera and one lens and nothing else because he believes the more equipment you have, the less pictures you take because you're spending too much time fiddling with your camera and lenses and changing stuff around as opposed to being open to what's out there and taking pictures of it. I did that for a while when I first learned this. I just took my camera with me with a 70 to 300 millimeter lens and I was amazed. There was very few photos I couldn't take with that one lens and I didn't have to carry my bag that I get exhausted from carrying all that baloney in my backpack. So it, it, he, he's, a, he was, he's influenced my life in more ways uh, just because of the number of lectures I've seen. In his book, Looking at Light First, you know, he's, he pretty much said, and you probably heard this before, in Genesis, they said that God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light was good. Ever since then, we complain that we have bad light. And in his opinion, and I agree, there's no such thing as bad light. There's spectacular light, and there's difficult light. For me, I tell an interesting story that when we travel, we quite often like to stay in bed and breakfasts because I would prefer to get a little local culture, local scene going on, and I can interact with the owners of the bed and breakfast as opposed to going to a cold restaurant where they don't want to talk to you. And I tell them I'm a photographer and have they got any ideas that might be different than just the typical shots that you can find in a tourist program where I might go and invariably they'll say something like, this is chamber of commerce weather. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's pure blue sun where most of us would go, oh gosh, we're not gonna get any interesting photos today. But I just shift what I'm gonna take photographs. I might've gone there for purposes of taking pictures of landscape, but the day it was very overcast and yucky for landscapes. So I'm gonna to switch to portraits so I can use the big soft box in the sky. So I switch my way around to depending on the way, whatever light's giving me. So you learn to learn with the light you've got. 
Remember that it's not just light, it's also dark. Shadows are important to create dimensionality in your photo. Light can control the color and light can also destroy your color. But light cannot destroy gestures. We'll find that out in a minute. It, it'll stand no matter what the light is. And I, like I said, I adjust to shoot based on what I've got. Color, color is kind of seductive. It changes as it interacts with other colors. And it changes because the light falling upon it can, can change as the light becomes larger and larger in size. So if, if it's a partly cloudy day and you look at some plants, there might be good saturation of the plants, but if you have bright sun shining on them, suddenly you don't have that saturation in the color. So color, color is important. Uh, to, a, to an extent, but one color by itself doesn't mean a darn thing. It acts like a vacuum. Um, it's when colors, other colors can relate. I mean, if you had just a blue wall and you took a picture of it, you'd have a frame of blue. That'd be all you have. So it takes something besides color to, to make some things happen. Now gesture, the thing that we're here to talk about, First thing I think you need to understand is that every photograph has both form and content. By form, we mean lines, shapes, colors, textures, space, composition, etc. Every photo's got that. Content, however, is the subject matter, how we interpret the subject, what was the intended meaning, and what it communicates to the viewer. So what we need to do is when we look at photographs, we need to look at both the form and the content. And a lot of times people get too stuck on form and the, that's where the content lacks in their photograph. So the gesture incorporates narrative and it can, pay, it, it, and it can convey every, all the emotional intellectual content. So I spend a lot of time before I'm snapping my shutters looking at gesture. I want that there to be some kind of meeting in that photograph. So light and color are about form. Gesture has content, but gesture can also have form. I mean, you're, you're, there's gonna be something. There's gonna be a shape. There's gonna be a composition. There's gonna be a something. Usually when I teach this class, it's after I've taught a class in compositional style. I teach about 17 compositional styles because they're the ones I use the most. And then this takes it beyond that thing. In other words, that people use to try to define gesture prior to, to Jay coming up with this idea was the essence of a photograph or the characteristic or the descriptive or what it reveals or its signature. Those are all trying to say the same thing. But it's not just people that have gesture. It's in everything. I can have gesture from a chair. I can have gesture from a table, from a house, from a car. If we're willing to look at it, it's there. We just have to be willing to take the time to find it. When I've taught this exercise one time, I decided to put in the corner of a room, a table, a chair, and a flashlight. And after I taught the class, I asked the people to go back in the corner and use whatever they find to imitate gesture. Now they, they did come up with some interesting things, but not one person picked up the flashlight other than to move it off the table so they could move the table. And that was intended to be a light source that would allow me to do interesting things with that table and chair. So you'll see some things here and you might not have thought of them as gesture, but they are. A good friend of mine, and, and, and I've known this for years, said that he was once told by a judge before judging an exhibition that there's something that they, he, they look, like, look at. Is the photograph in front of me the photograph of a pretty subject or is it a pretty photograph of a subject? Anybody can find something beautiful and just snap a picture. That, that's not really making a picture. That's just taking a picture. But if I've got to work at it, to find the best composition, find interesting things about that subject, that's worth a lot more to a judge and to a viewer who might potentially purchase your work than I've got a beautiful model or a pretty flower and I just went and took a picture of it. So when I judge and I've done a fair amount of judging myself, 
that's one of the things I remind myself as I look at each one of the photos. Is it just a kind of, I'll call it the, the lucky, happy, snappy of a, of, a, of a subject? Or was that something somebody spent some time to make that something very special? Um, get this down a little bit. Um, you have to learn to leave yourself open and not spend a huge amount of time with anxiety searching for things to happen. Thing, if you're open, things will come to you. Ernst Haas said that we don't take pictures, we're taken by pictures. Finding light gesture and colors, a little like trying to hold water. So if you're trying to hold water in your hand and you cup your hand like this, if you pour some water in there and you remain still, that water will stay in your hand. But if you're gonna force it and close your hand, the water's gonna scatter. So you need to be patient. You need to allow yourself to be filled with the scene and see what emotes to you before you take the picture. The other thing I've learned a lot is always shoot it now. Um, it won't be there when you come back. Uh, too many times I, I was on my way to do something and I passed a great scene and said, well, on the way back, I'll catch it. On the way back, it wasn't there. Too many things change. And remain true to yourself. I spend a great deal of time criticizing my own work. I'm, I don't think anybody could hurt my feelings because I've already done it to myself. But if I can remain true to who I am and my style and look at photos through that lens, I'll be better off. All right, what's happened here? I'm not gonna spend much time, but in another club that I was lecturing to, they were having a debate as to what what were you allowed to do to enter a photo in competition? And one of the things they were talking about was some things that people do in Photoshop maybe shouldn't be allowed in competition. So I put this up in this lecture just for them, but that's a picture I took of a pile of buttons. That wasn't organized like that. I took my grandmother's jar of old buttons. I dumped them out on a table I adjusted the light and I took a picture. It's a pretty picture of buttons. But if I wanted to add implied gesture, something going on in that photo with, with less than two minutes effort, I came up with that. That's that exact same picture, just used a twirl function in Photoshop to come up with that. There's movement in this picture. It does have gesture. It's very different, but when people see them side by side, they're generally interested by that. So in this case, effectively, our lips, how we talk is done through our cameras. That's, that's our communications vehicle is what we're doing in the camera. And we have to remember that God made all things well. So first, let's start showing some pictures now. First, starting with large animals. I'm not going to bother to read these poems to you. You're probably familiar with them. But let's start with a giraffe. It happens to be my favorite animal. It's a decent picture of a giraffe. The background's way too busy, but it is contextual in that the giraffe was in its natural habitat. It's lit reasonably well. There's, you know, I, I don't even know if I'd call it a good photo, but it's an okay photo, but there's no gesture there. It's just an animal sitting there doing nothing. But if I want to add gesture, that adds gesture to the photograph. One of the things is I watch to learn behaviors. Uh, I've, I watch birds, I watch all kinds of animals, and I've learned that like humans, they will repeat gestures. And so uh, this photo is interesting to me. I know that an animal with a long neck is gonna have to bend down to see an animal that's smaller than that, or even to get a drink of water, as you'll see later, or something. And so by, I waited. The baby was the one that was, was walking. The adult was standing. It looked to me like they were gonna to come together. I knew from previous trips that the behavior was gonna be is that's how they're gonna greet. So I focused my camera, took a couple test shots, making sure my white balance, everything was perfect. And as soon as they bend down and touch, click, 
one photo done. And that has way more impact than say the photo to the left. Or this is the whole family. It's the bull, it's the mother, it's the baby and it's last year's baby there. And it, it back to the, the eyes of faith, you could put one word on their family, hang it on the wall and you could convey a message to people. But taking this photo, let's take another lesson on here. One of the things I often do is convert photos to black and white because I wanna see if, there's, if it's the color is creating any kind of distraction in the photo. And I wanna know if the impact or the gesture is still strong when I take color away. So if I convert this photo to black and white, and I actually personally like the black and white better, um, but that's nothing done to make that black and white better. That's just remove saturation, just quick to see. And I say, no, the gesture's still there. The message that this photograph is trying to imply to the viewer did not change because the color was or wasn't there. But there's other components, assuming that you print and display this. You've got a mat, you've got a frame, and you have a gallery card. So you've got the photo plus these three things. That's what you've got to show your viewer. And that's all you've got to show your viewer. So I quite often, I have ways that I can quickly put my photos inside different situations on the computer to get a feel for how I want to mount and print and display this photo. So this is the typical, my, my pro that I took lessons from did almost everything, black frames, white background saying the photos, the is the thing. So this is what this looks like. It looks fine to me. The black and white would look even better in that frame. Some people might be surprised by the gallery card. That was the bull. That was not the mother that was caressing that baby. That was the father. Obviously on that card, you would have your contact information, maybe a price you were going to charge. This is what you've got. So if you don't have a photo that's capturing attention and keeping them inside that frame, they're just going to walk on to the next photo. So you've got to find something that's going to give them at least that extra little bit of a look in your photo. So usually this is an interactive discussion, but we can't do that over Zoom easily. So, but to me, I see tons of gesture in this photo. There were three giraffes walking one behind the other. I stopped my car, I focused on them, and I said, I wonder what'll happen when they notice I'm here. I gave a quick, <laughs> nothing louder than that. The first giraffe stopped, the second and third giraffe didn't. I pre-focused on that first one as soon as they stopped, and as soon as that second one walked up, I snapped the picture. If you look carefully at those two giraffes, is that one giraffe with two heads and eight legs, or is that two giraffes? It's pretty difficult to tell because of the way the rectangles and things mesh together. And the other one's even like, like, like saying something to the other two. So there's plenty of gesture in this photo, which will get people's attention. It's almost like a double take. You have to look at that to figure out because it's really difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. Slight gesture here, giraffes are tall animals. This is the baby giraffe. I was able to get underneath that giraffe because it came over to my vehicle and waited until instead of having its head in my lap wanting to be lick my hand and eat, it was stuck its head up into the sky and I was able to shoot up at it and capture it. And that's why I call this the head in the clouds. This particular animal which is a black buck, a female black buck. It's a good portrait, I would call it. You know, everything, the composition's good, the color, the texture, the tech, everything technically about this photo is fine. Not great, but it's good. But does this have more gesture? We kind of know what the next step's gonna be. And so these two photos have far more impact than that first photo because they imply something, something people can relate to. Or this uh, scimitar, uh, 
it was walking across the pasture on a, this was probably three o'clock in the afternoon, hot, high nineties. There's one pond in the pasture. And I thought they've got pretty deep sides on that. I don't know how an animal is going to get a drink of water. And these are pretty tall animals. So I, I, I waited and it knelt down and it could reach and take a drink. So there's a little bit of gesture even in this photo, just from the fact that the animal was kneeling down. And by the way, this is actually considered one of the most fierce of the exotic animals. If you can imagine that one of its biggest predators is, uh, is a lion, for example. But when a lion comes, it leaps onto things. If this animal literally bent and put its head down, those two horns would be straight up like skewers. And when that lion came down, they'd be skewed by the horns on this animal, like this. The, the animal on the right had his uh, brood of females and the other one was about 50 yards off. And the one on the right started saying like, don't come any closer, but the one on the left decided they were gonna to continue to come. And so I knew something was gonna happen. So I focused on the one that wasn't moving and the other one came and this ensued. So I got high speed shutter, I'm taking picture after picture. I chose this one. It did end up that the new uh, uh, male came in and did win the whole herd of, of the females. The other one, I saw no signs of blood, but it did limp some. So it was injured in some way, which we reported uh, into the, uh, to the house. But I knew the behaviors. I knew what was gonna happen. There's no real gesture here, but it looks like a mother and baby white rhinoceros. Well, it's not technically true. This is an adoptive mother who had lost a baby and when this baby was born, its real mother disowned it from, from the first minute. And this other one adopted it as if it was their baby. And even though the, mother, the real mother is in the pasture, the pet never comes near this baby whatsoever. So I just included it in here. It's not that it's gesture, it's just an interesting story. I think there's at least some gesture here on that hot sunny day with the facial expressions on this animal. And if that's not... Uh, something that came from the dinosaur age. I'm not sure what, what is. I'm not sure how many uh, white rhinos people see here. Usually I have them and sometimes they say three and sometimes four. There's actually five rhinos there. You can see three, I'll call them horns for lack of a better word, to the right. And you'll see the tip of one to the left as well as the full one. There's five of them. I often wondered what a herd of rhinos was called. And it's called a crash, which I thought was an appropriate name for them. This uh, addicts from Egypt and Sudan, a mother and baby, they look like twins. The markings are so close to very identical and the horns will get crooked as the animals age. There's a reason I took this picture and included it in the presentation. That's a baby bongo. And the bongo is the, the, the largest of this type of animal. This one's a baby. They start out with a very roached back and then over time they get very large and um, the backs straighten out, but they almost never come out. They're a woodland animal and they stay in the woods and they don't come out until at least dusk. And I was on a night shoot when this baby ventured out. And even though it looks like daylight, that's just my exposure settings of how I was able to expose to pick this up because this is a rare photo that anybody can get because they don't come out where you can take pictures of them. This, this, uh, this is actually an interesting photo. I think there is gesture here of this emu. The, uh, I've taken a lot of pictures of emus and the light 
was hitting the, the eyeballs just right to add this color. I did not add the color to this photo. Usually they're much darker brown. And I call this a bad hair day. But the one thing you've got to be careful of if you go out to shoot emus is they're attracted to bright, shiny objects like the end of your lens on your camera with a sharp beak and their beak is powerful. And I happened to be in a safari vehicle and our interpreter said, you guys with these big cameras, you might not want to use them or you better catch them before they get to the vehicle because I can't tell you how many people, people's cameras have been broken by these animals. So I had a 400 millimeter lens with me. I saw them coming running across the field towards the safari vehicle. And so I'm shooting it all the way, happened to get one photo that was worthwhile. But I think this thing screams with gesture be because you just won't see it in this light. I've never been able to reproduce this photograph. These are water bucks. And again, the one to the left, the male, the female, the baby, or the one on the right with twins nursing. So there is some gesture in that animal. This one is a good one to make you laugh, but I used to raise horses and own a horse farm. And I know that they can do this, especially if they see food, this is what will happen. So the people that were in a vehicle in front of me, the kids were trying to hand out treats to this animal, which you're not supposed to do to zebra. So I had my camera ready and and uh, as soon as it saw it, it did this. And I've used this photo for other purposes uh, as a way on, a, on a, one of my cards to make this come to life. So somebody has one of my business cards, it can quickly turn into a two and a half minute video using, jet, using hybrid photography and a free app. It's a pretty interesting way to advertise your business if you wanna set your, your marketing up to be different than everybody else that's showing at the same show with you. When I first came upon this scene, it reminded me of a mirror. It looked to me like a mirror image of these animals. So once again, and it still looked like a mirror to me. And so that to me was more the gesture in this photo, if you would say, it's, it's small but the fact that it's eyeball to eyeball looking like mirror image, much like you'd see with water, it, it, it was uh, pretty interesting. And I sometimes use these slides as to end the show, but I'm not doing that here today. But there's some obviously symmetry here uh, that can add interest. Let's switch from animals to people. And let's take a look at a few examples of people. I was in the back streets of London, walking around and I could hear a tuba playing. I just had to find it because I played the tuba. When I got there, I was intrigued when he started playing and all of a sudden fire starts coming out of the bell of the tuba to the, to the rhythm of the music that they were playing. There certainly is gesture in this photo. Uh, because you wouldn't normally see a guy in a tuxedo playing a symphonic instrument uh, with some accompaniment with fire coming out of the bell. It's something different. Or two of my grandchildren a number of years ago, my grandson number one didn't like having his picture taken and number two didn't want to have it taken next to his sister. So he was sitting there one of the things I've learned about doing portrait, I used to do a lot of portrait photographer, especially multi-generational stuff here in Sun City with small family groupings, is that quite often the photos that sell the best are the ones that you as a photographer think are the worst. And we did the same thing. We hired a professional to take our family's picture and the one that every member of my family bought was I'm sure by the photo photographer as a throwaway because we were holding our grandkids and one's pulling Emily's hair, the other one's pulling my tie, this one's screaming and the next one's standing there shining beautifully with a beautiful smile. 
but that that one's the one we can laugh and remember the day with. So he was looking like this, and his father said, John, now you think he's smiling. He's not smiling. He's actually going to start to cry, but he was definitely not going to get near his sister. So there is gesture here in the expression. Uh, she sits there pretty as a picture. Uh, he's the typical little boy that's going to do what he's going to do. Or I heard their baby sister in, in the uh, room, and I asked if I could go in since I heard her waking up. I didn't have anything with me but the iPhone. I didn't know exactly what I was going to face when I got in there, but the way the light was coming through the draperies, I thought was interesting. And so I took my iPhone out, I focused on the ribs, and then the baby saw me and was just getting to the point where it could lift its head and lifted its head up. So I had a great composition. And to me, I've got gesture in this photograph um, immediately just because of that. Or we were over in Italy with some of my family. And this was not a staged photo. It was so windy, you could barely walk in this city. So I lined them up against the wall. I was having a hard time with my iPhone, even holding it steady to take this picture. But there's plenty of gesture in there because everything's blowing all over the place, yet they're having a great time. It was funny. Or the sucker makes, in my opinion, makes the photo. You know, the baby, once again, now a little older, goes out for trick or treat, comes back, has got the dimples going because of the sucker. It was not been that kind of picture had she not had an implement in her hand. Or I did some photography where I followed uh, my daughter-in-law into the room to get the baby. These were not posed photos. I was looking to create a series of black and whites for a, for a project I was working on of a, of a mother and child and showing the love and that. And I wanted to capture them without there being anything set up by me so they would look natural. So these are a couple of them from that series. Switching to, I'll use birds, small animals. Again, you can see the part of the poetry. But these are in my backyard. Um, but the bluebird, uh, I thought was more interesting. They, it was building a nest in there. So to capture the fact that the bluebird is building a nest and sticking its head out the hole was a more interest, potentially, especially with that piece of nesting there, than it would be taking the bird on a stick, if you will. I could get a great portrait, but this to me has more impact. This I call six more weeks of winter, but being able to find this black neck still in California at just the right time when the sun was casting a shadow for this to be seen. There's gesture in that photo, something that's going to cause people to look at it, especially when they see the title of the photo, six more weeks of winter. And it can make them stay there and study things. Or you had this bird on your Instagram today, Linda, the golden fronted woodpecker, male. Um, and just the way it's cocking its head and stuff, to me, there's gesture. The one you had today also had gesture in it as well. But it's looking, not just taking pictures that are, let's call it, perfectly straight on with no turning or expression. Or this one. Uh, of the uh, Paraluxia. Par Paraluxia, the male. But I dragged the shutter on this because it was misting rain and I wanted to be able to elongate the drops to show that. And if you pull in close, you'll see the droplets of water all over this bird. To me, there's gesture just because of the way it was perched, crouching down in the rain, looking the rain. There's gesture here that's going to cause uh, and I've had a lot of compliments on this particular photo. It's beautiful as a print. I was told by the person that owned this ranch down in South Texas around Del Rio um, that it's rare to see cactus wren as a pair. Uh, you'll see one or the other. I don't know if that's true or not, 
but they landed there. So I took their picture. But if you look at it, I do have almost like they're guarding. One's looking one direction, the other's looking the other direction. So there's this tiny bit of gesture there. Here with the, the vultures, uh, there's gesture in that I've caught something in flight is much better than just taking a portrait of a bird on a stick, if you will. There was, in fairness, a piece of really raw ripe chicken tied to this branch that I removed, but they were taking turns going at this chicken and tearing it apart. This particular bird here, I, I got chastised um, because I thought it was a Western scrub jay. I little did I know that they uh, split that variety into two pieces a couple of years ago. So this is no longer a Western scrub jay. It's now called a Woodhouse scrub jay. But I did notice as I saw them come in to feed that quite often as they're trying to catch their balance on the edge of a rock, they have to put their wings and feathers out to rebalance themselves from landing. So I was patient, focused on the rock that I thought they were gonna to come to and was able to catch the dance of the Woodhouse scrub jay, which is gonna add more interest. It shows the full bird, it shows the beautiful colors, but it has more interest than just a bird on a stick. Or what we were talking about before we came on air was hummingbirds. And yes, I do shoot hummingbirds with flash, high speed sync. It does not scare my hummingbirds away and they come back. Um, this is also a great black and white photo, but I captured exactly what I wanted was two female black neck hummingbirds. Um, very interesting. And yeah, there was a feeder maybe five or six feet to the left of them on this photo. But I noticed that quite often as birds were coming to the feeder, they would have these little duels to see who's gonna go first. So I pre-focused on a pair that did this before and then stood there and waited until the next one came, snapped one photo, high speed sync and captured that photo. And to me, it, it's got great gesture. Or these beautiful little animals, um, the, uh, I gotta remember what they're called, sanderlings out in California below the Golden Gate Bridge. They're tidal birds. And so when the tide when the rushes back out, they quickly run, which is how you got the motion on the feet because I was panning out, dig quickly for little crabs and then run back as the water's coming back in. And so to me, this has gesture because photographers understand how you can accomplish it, but most people cannot figure out why are the feet not in focus, but the rest of the bird is in focus. Or out in California again, and really windy, cold day, I couldn't see much, but I walked to the edge of the cliff and looked down and there's all these brown pelicans. So I decided I would focus and wait and see something coming in for a landing. So it's like brown, the brown uh, pelican heliport and grab this shot, which adds much more photo than if I had just taken a picture of the birds sitting on rocks. If we move to flowers, the ones that I saw in my previous lecture saw this, if you look at this uh, photograph carefully and you look at the word that it describes it, it's balance. And if you look at this, you go, how can you balance that flower on one dead petal in the middle? Well, from a technical perspective, it wasn't a photograph taken with a camera. It was taken with a scanner. So things were laying on a scanner bed, but made to look as if this was there. But that adds the interest. When you see the word balance and you see this sticking on there, it, it's quite easy to see uh, actually a, a beautiful photo of a flower supposedly balanced on something that's impossible to do. It could never hold the weight of the flower. Or 
playing with flowers to come up and I call this one smile. And so you've got the eyes and you've got the smile built in to this. This one, windy day out near the airport and saw this from a distance, had a 300 millimeter lens, was able to crank the shutter up. And even though it was blowing, I was able to get it in a different position from the way you normally see a common day flower. So that here you can see the big ears, the eyes, the nose, the outstretched arms. You can see everything there. You can imagine this flower being almost like alive, like an animal. Or this one, I was laying on the ground, taking a picture of just the blue green photo below. And before I snapped the picture, this white blossom came from I don't know where. And as soon as it came on, the first thing that came in my mind is a nightcap. And so that's what I call this nightcap blue flower or something. And it's an interesting photo. It's very different. It's going to be a double take. I've had people look at that. And is that like what the blossoms look like when they first, when they really open up? And it's like, no, they don't look like that at all. <laughs> but I don't know where this one came from. But I didn't put it there. Or looking at an orchid. This is an iPhone shot close up. I said, well, I'd like something a little more intimate than that. So using a macro on an iPhone, I was able to capture this. And I saw things I never saw looking at an orchid. I'm sure a million people have seen these pictures before, but uh, I love the picture. Um, and I was amazed that I could capture it with an iPhone and a macro, but it came out pretty well. This is an example of using light to add gesture to a photograph. This photo took me almost eight hours to shoot. Did I sit there for eight hours? No, but the hibiscus was at my daughter-in-law's place and I just kept going out watching the shadow move across this because I wanted something to cast a shadow inside that flower to add some kind of gesture, some kind of impact. And so I was able to capture that again with an iPhone uh, by going out about every half an hour, over eight hours until the light got exactly the way I wanted it to be. Or starting to animate flowers, almost like a teacher or a parent speaking to the children. Again, this is done on a scanner. Or a bowl full of flowers done on a scanner. It's different. Moving into landscapes, cityscapes, waterscapes, Again, from the poem. This happens to be my all time favorite photograph I've ever taken. Not saying it's my best, but it's my favorite because of the story that went with it. And it's the perfect example of gesture. I used to live on the coast of New Hampshire, 10 minutes from this scene in Maine, the Noble Lighthouse. I've got this lighthouse in almost every kind of weather you could imagine but they were forecasting a pretty sunrise. So I'm driving on the big Interstate 95 bridge going over and all this black stuff moved in. And I thought, darn it, there's not gonna be any sunrise today, but well, I'm already halfway here, I'll keep going. So I set up all my equipment. I was composed, I was ready to take a picture. There was no light in this picture. It was as if I was there at three o'clock in the morning. It was about 10 below zero. This picture was taken in January and I'm on the ocean, so it's cold. The sun was to come up at 6.30, and then it became 6.35, 6.40, 6.45. I said, okay, pack it in. Started to take my camera off the tripod when I noticed this little light starting to pop through. So I said, I'm gonna hang in here another couple of minutes. To make a long story short, I fired off 10 photos changing the shutter speed on each one because at the, at the time I had not learned about HDR and bracketing and all that. So I had to do it manually. So I took 10 differently exposed photos and then exposure blended those photos, nine of them together in post-processing. This is probably the photo I've spent the most time ever on, um, but it also sells every time I, I put it up for sale. Um, you can see the wreath. And the red, it was still decorated from Christmas. Little snow, but cold. But 
I did not light the lighthouse afterwards. I waited because it came around on a time cycle. And as long as I got one of the nine photos right, I had a lit lighthouse. This is on an island. The only way you can get there is by this little car that you can ride back and forth. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, and I really like the, the jet trails that were left going to Portland, Maine's uh, thing, all about the color of the decorations. It's, to me, it's, it's a great photo and, and reminds me to take my time, be patient, and it'll come. Or this photo. There was a Model A convention in Georgetown, and all the, the parking places around the courthouse were full. And I noticed this Franklin was sitting all by itself. I don't know if anybody else notices this or not, but this could actually be a period photo from 1921. Because if you look at the car, it's a 1921 Franklin parked in front of a building built in 1902. And there is nothing here because they, they still have in these windows the warped glass so that nothing, I didn't do anything to the glass or anything in this photo. It just looks like this. And if you wanna make it look more period, change it to black and white. And I could have done other antiquing things, but for all the world, this is a photo that is, I'll call it almost a post-processing gesture because when I took the picture, I thought I was taking a picture of a cool car. I didn't notice the 1902, 1921 until I was doing the post-processing of that particular photo. This was taken five feet from my front door. There was a horrific hailstorm a number of years ago that wiped out about three quarters of the roofs in Sun City. And I was out trying to take pictures as best I could in my covered area of the lightning strikes. And I was having okay luck, but all of a sudden it got dark enough because this was probably five o'clock at night. It got dark enough that the street light automatically came on. And to me, that was the gesture. I wanted to ask my wife if she would go put on a red or yellow coat and go stand under the light. But uh, it wasn't too long after that till we had a horrific hailstorm. So I'm kind of glad I didn't do that, but um, she would have just told me, I'll flip, I'll click the shutter, you go stand under the light. But that that's that's only two houses down from me. But to me, when the light came on, that's the gesture in the photograph. I know we did fireworks a couple of weeks ago. I do fireworks a little different, but there's this is seven photographs. Um, because I shoot blooms individually and com compose them in post-processing. The post-processing time on this photo is less than two minutes, um, but I can organize it the way I want. And this was from my condo balcony in the mountains, New Year's Eve. And I had to do one photo to set the stage to catch the light on one of the ski slopes. At the same time is these, these things, because I was up on the ridge as high as you could go where the fireworks were exploding was literally right in my face. I mean. It was unbelievable, it was so beautiful. And because it was very, very cold, you don't see a lot of smoke because the way I take photos, I, I don't have the smoke in the fireworks. I do them a little different. So I don't have to remove smoke. You see a, a little bit on the ground here and you can see the fire down here where they were firing the fireworks from. Um, but I'm about 500 feet above this. So it was, it, it made for some really beautiful photos on that shoot. Or in Germany, in Baden-Baden, I wanted, uh, we were on a walking tour and, and kind of the joke between my wife and I is she needs to always be in sight of where the rest of the group is and I need to be in sight of her. But I liked these and I went to Baden-Baden and I saw all these sculptures, but I went to their website and I found no pictures of anything there. This picture is so far superior to what I saw there, but putting her in scale just shows you how big these things are. And they're just sculptures. They're, they're not of a utilitarian purpose. And then the color was just spectacular. Again, this is an iPhone shot. 
This one, this is a good example of gesture where you walk around until you find something interesting. It was a pretty picture of the sculpture. It was a pretty picture of the building. Uh, it was a pretty picture of the tulips. But by walking around and taking a look at this carefully, you'll see that the gesture of, of the sculpture was kind of like I now present to you. And it's almost like they're looking at a modern day iPhone. Obviously it's not, but it, to me, there's just tons of gesture in this particular photo, um, in my opinion. Or this one, I was waiting for a bus near the Eiffel Tower to go out to see a mansion. And I noticed this was happening while I was in Paris that on wedding days, it's not unusual for the wedding couple to go out the morning of their wedding and take pictures and walk to different famous places. And I said, I'm looking at this and I'm going, what, this guy, they're taking selfies. The guy's got a remote shutter release there. I've got nothing but my iPhone with me once again. So I walked over there and waited until they had a pose like this. This happened to be one of the best places to take a picture of an Eiffel Tower. And I've got the wedding kiss selfie at the Eiffel Tower. Um, I wished I'd have got their name, but I don't speak French well enough to have conversed with them. So, because this photo would have been precious. Although I'm sure that this photographer was probably getting some great shots as well, but it was a wonderful street photograph. Everybody's seen these, one of my granddaughters at the Louvre, or this one at the window in Big Bend. I was having breakfast one day and I noticed these strange colors, almost rainbow colors coming up beyond the window. And I said something to the waiter. I said, this is kind of weird. He says, well, it happens under the right conditions. Every once in a while, we'll see these rainbow colors. He said, they're not gonna stay long if you wanna get a picture. Well, I was having breakfast. So I didn't have my camera with me. So once again, my trusty iPhone, I ran over there quick and took this photo and I call it rainbow sunrise at the window. But the gesture is really the color in this particular photo. This is a nothing photo in black and white. So it does require color to be worth much of anything. This is a beggar in Germany. You see the string attached to that. So anytime somebody went to reach down to put something in their basket, they were gonna do something funny. It was just a funny, photo of a beggar. You don't usually see something like this. This is up at Lake Louise in, in uh, Canada. And I was there probably about three weeks before the complete melt. So these were frozen waves in Lake Louise um, with, with the, uh, what the word, lost the word, um, coming down behind it. And I just thought it was interesting. I, I would have loved to have been there just to see the perfect reflection on Lake Louise like you quite often see, but this was also pretty unique. The color was pretty special and these are all frozen. Just out of the scene here, they, they had a sign that says no kayaking dangerous. I'm like, I don't know what idiot would try to go out there and kayak, but evidently somebody must have tried it at some point. Or this is in Switzerland, in, uh, in, in one of my, my favorite cities. Uh, it's the Chapel Bridge in Lucerne. Mm -hmm. And I used to work there for a number of years. The, uh, it's just a, a beautiful place. So I consider this a beautiful picture. I'm not sure I see a huge amount of gesture in here, but it is, a pretty picture. And I said I'd show some with and some without. To me, there is gesture here. I'm usually up early on the riverboat cruise, this was, taking photos. And I liked the way the fog was setting in, but around the village, it wasn't foggy, but, but in the surroundings it was. And I liked the arrowhead that was being created, you know, here 
pointing to the island that was in full fog. This is not a great photo, but it's still an example of I was in a castle and I saw this U shape in the river, but that would have been an absolute zero photograph. But I just kind of hung out there out the window of the castle until something happened and the boat came around and I captured this. Again, it's not a great photo, I know that, but it's still an example of being patient and waiting for something to happen to make it more interesting than it otherwise would have been. It's, it happens to be in the, on the Mosul River in Germany. This was an interesting photo. It's on a moving boat at sunset. You obviously can't use a tripod. It's moving, beautiful sunset. How do I take a picture? Nothing to take a picture of, but trees usually. But I saw up a, up a ways, I saw this, this uh, mechanical objects and I just waited until they got there so that I could silhouette them against that sky to make a much more interesting photo. This was from my balcony in my condo. This is what I looked out on every, every morning. This particular day, I was slightly above the clouds Often I was above the clouds. There's usually an inversion here in the mornings. Or up in Alaska, I love the texture of the totems and things, or these totems, which actually were laying on the ground, but I love the color, the repetition of the pattern, the texture, even the moss and stuff that was growing out of these old totems was interesting to me. This has got gesture. You might not pick it up unless you saw this thing blown up as a print. But I was walking in Venice in the back streets with my iPhone. And I was told by the person at the hotel that you've got to go out and walk the back streets and get lost. That's part of the attraction to coming to Venice. And I was clearly lost. I didn't have a camera, but I had my iPhone. And I came across this. And what attracted to me was the color, the texture changes and the pattern, and the fact that it wasn't unusual on Tuesdays to see people hanging their laundry out. What was interesting about this picture was what fell to the ground, which was a purple pair of underpants, to which to me is the gesture and the comedy in this photo, although it's still an interesting photo for other reasons. Or if you've been to the painted churches here in Texas, I take groups down there almost every year. And this particular photo, I, I don't go inside the painted churches anymore because it's they're small and I let others go take those pictures because I've been there so many times. So I stay outside either in the graveyards or whatever, but it was a nice windy day. The clouds were great. I said, I'm going to hang out here and wait and try to catch both flags unfurled and came up with, with, uh, with this photo, which to me, if the flags were dead or out of kilter would not have been the same gesture as what I was able to capture. This uh, uh, particular was in Trier in Germany. It's considered the most Roman city outside of Rome. We were there on Good Friday and they were setting up what was going to later be a, a reincarnation of the, uh, of the crucifixion. I thought, what an interesting juxtaposition that the Romans were the ones that were putting Jesus to death. And I'm in the most Roman city celebrating the resurrection uh, that was going to happen on that Sunday. So it'd be the crucifixion followed by the interaction. And I thought it was interesting. They've never quite figured out what these ellipses are. There's seven ellipses in this city, but they haven't quite figured out why they're there. But I believe looking at the holes in the wall and stuff, they had big paintings or something hanging there, but nobody knows for sure. Again, this is a graveyard at the painted churches. And I thought it was just really interesting with all the lichens and stuff growing on this with again, decent clouds in the background, adding more interest and impact and gesture to this photo. It doesn't have to be moving to be impactful. This particular one is, is obviously the, the white rhino's feet. And then in a state park, 
picture of the cypress and I just saw interesting parallels between the feet of the animal and the base of these trees. That concludes, Linda, uh, what I came prepared to speak about. Well, thank you, Don. You know, I was, when you first started, I thought, I'm not following this, I don't get this. And then when she started, like, it was just layers that started unfolding and it just, it makes so much sense now. It absolutely just kind of came to life as you illustrated some of the, the photos that you showed and just the, um, the narratives that you offered. So I, I, I really got, I personally got a lot out of your presentation. So thank you for, for sharing this with us. I'm gonna get you to take your screen down. And one of the things that I have found um, interesting is that there are tons of comments in the um, chat line, no questions. And I wonder if that's because you just checked all our boxes for us. So I wanna, that, that's really, very un unusual. And so there's just a lot of awesome presentations and, and excellent um, images and some of the stories. The last um, image that you showed of those trees, that was just like, okay, I would have never ever connected those, those feet of those rhinoc rhinoceros. So I, I find that um, your observations are, are very attuned. And so I thank you so much for coming and thank you for sharing what you know. Um, one of the things that in your, you, you don't have a personal website. Is there any way that if anybody had any questions or wanted to get in touch with you, is there any contact information that you'd like to share with, it, with us? Um, I am on Instagram. Okay. Uh, it's more of a family and close friends website. I, you know, at my age, at this point, I, I don't see the point, even though I'm a webmaster and I have webmasters for plenty of sites around the world, including some of the biggest and best in the whole world, like the New York Stock Exchange uh, and, and some of those like that. But at this point at my age, and some health issues, I see no reason because I don't really exhibit, yeah. I never compete. Um, if I lecture, I lecture. And I have a few people that have used me once in a while. I judge, I judge once in a while. I've mentored students privately. But, you know, at, at Donald B. Simpson, you'll, you could get through there or my email address, donaldbsimpson at gmail.com or call me on my phone. Don't I'm don't give don't, yeah. I was gonna say don't give out that number because this will go to YouTube. So who knows yeah, know. who will find that? So, um, but I'll I will link your um, Instagram and um, your email if you don't mind. I'll share that through YouTube. So um, thank you, Don, for coming. And I'm going to nail you down for early next year to come back. Um, if you guys are joining us for the first time, I'd like to invite you to check out the YouTube channel, Linda Nichols Happiness Hour, where you'll find our previous sessions. And if you'll subscribe, you'll get notified when new sessions are added to the library. Next week, Tom Snitzer will be here to present Becoming an HDR Ninja. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.